Hello everybody and welcome back. And thanks once again for joining me. Okay. S similar blues here, so just being careful I didn't grab the wrong one. Because that would kind of suck. Oh, I tell you. These ends have been really getting on my nerves the last couple days. Busy morning. Went for my walk and had to do laundry, and then my husband came home. So, when I normally would have been filming, so I guess it's a good thing it got put off for a while. Yeah, he had to come home to get a tool from the garage for work, and then he sort of stuck his head in the house to let me know because um, our security system chimes whenever you open one of the doors. So he wanted me to know that it was him and not some random person coming to uh, take stuff from the garage because, yeah, that would be not so good. Actually, that was helpful once because I remember hearing the door chime and then nothing. And I came and looked and yeah, it hadn't latched properly and uh, the wind blew it open. So yeah, I had to go and fix that. Or um, if you open a door and leave it open, it will tell you after a few minutes, you'll get um, a notification on your phone, unusual activity. So yeah, so like even though kiddo knows the code, he have a hard time uh, sneaking out because if you enter or leave the house or deactivate the system at an unusual time, there will be a notification of it the next day on your uh, phone. Because I've had that when my husband had to go out of town and uh, he had to leave, you know, super early because it was a really long drive. So like three in the morning and then I'll get in the morning, you know, alarm was deactivated at 3.12 a.m. or whatever and front door was opened at, you know. So, yeah, I had one time, was it summer? And we slept in really late, so I didn't get up to un, uh, deactivate the alarm until like, couple hours past my usual time and then it was like you know unusual activity alarm was deactivated I was like okay yes I slept in I don't need you judging me <laughs> oh my goodness I am aware of what type it is yeah yeah I'm more tuned to be a night owl Always have been. My son is similar. When he was younger, of course, he was, well, babies, right? They like to be up at like six. But now that he's a teenager, yeah. He's like me. Normal schedule, society schedule is not, not good for us. Okay, so I think we'll put these aside now. Yeah, they're far enough out of the diagonal. And we'll just carry on this way. Okay, just taking a look. I'm probably going to go further down the diagonal, work my way back up. Yeah, that's just sort of what makes sense to me right now. So that's what I'll do. Yeah, so it's nice. It's finally warm enough to go outside for walks, but still got to wear my earmuffs. Discovered my ears are very sensitive to a uh, cold wind. I went without them once because it wasn't that cold out, and I had a 
jacket on. So I figured, yeah, it's a little windy, but I'll be fine. But I had to turn back early because uh, my ears were just aching so bad. I thought having headphones, earbuds in would help a bit because like the wind wouldn't be blowing, you know, right down the ear canal, but it didn't matter. Yeah, it was cold enough that it still hurt. Ached for like half an hour after I got home, so I learned my lesson. Wear my earmuffs. If it turns out it's too hot and I don't need them, I'll just take them off and, you know, carry them or hang them around my neck. But yeah, until it's actually like summer and time to wear a sun hat, I need the earmuffs. I wonder if people think they're headphones. <laughs> Ooh. It's actually uh, my son's, an old set of his. It has um the heart eye emojis on the ears. I guess he got too cool for it. He wanted a plain black one this uh, winter. So I bought him that and then the, his old ones are mine. I don't mind. I think they're cute. Yeah, and then I downloaded one of those uh, step counters on my phone, so we get about five to 6,000 steps a day. Wasn't sure it was that much, but. Oh, any exercise is good, right? Yeah, and I'm kind of limited in what exercises I can do because of the bad joints. Lifting weights is out and a lot of Pilates is out because uh, it's too easy to stretch too far. And uh, like I don't get um, dislocations that are really, you know, dramatic or anything. It's just sort of pop and it hurts. But uh, still, you don't want to be pushing your body past its limits, right? It's not good for you. So, And then, yeah, I can't jog because, again, that hurts the ankles and knees and such. So... Walking it is. I could swim, but I, I'm lazy to go to the, to the pool or the gym. It's just, you know, it's like, oh, what do you mean? So I gotta, you know, drive all the way there, and then I gotta get into my bathing suit, and then I gotta go for the, you know, and then I gotta take a shower, and then I gotta get back in my street clothes, and then I gotta drop home. It's like, oh, well, that's just, I'm already tired just thinking about it. But walks, walks I can do. Yeah, we have a nice park with a lake in the middle. So that's usually the uh, the route I take. Is uh, a few blocks from the house, then take a, a circuit around the lake and then come back home. It's about four kilometers. And every now and then I might go an extra couple of blocks out of my way to add some extra to it, so. Yeah, it's nice because we got at least quite a few bike trails that sort of go off the main roads and between houses and stuff. So you don't have to worry about traffic so much. Meet some people on the way, people walking their dogs and stuff. So, yeah. And if I do go for a walk. I generally sleep better that night, so that is definitely motivation for me to keep doing it. Okay, that one is too close to the grid, and it's the wrong color. There we go. Oh, I want to grab both threads. That would work better. Yeah, I really liked swimming as a kid, but now I'm thinking, I can't remember the last time I did it. Uh, I mean, even the last couple of times I was using my bathing suit was to sit in someone's hot tub, not to actually swim. And that was a while ago. Of course, that was in the pre-pandemic times. Oh. 
or skating. I used to love to skate. I haven't gone since I was like 17 or something. And it's been a long, long time. We have quite a few um, free outdoor uh, rinks here in town, but I don't own any skates. Yeah, so I like watching it. <laughs> Figure skating is the one sport I follow. But yeah, it's cold enough out here in the winter that you can have free outdoor rinks. Of course, sometimes then it's too cold to use them. I remember one uh, one Christmas we went to this uh, party and they were going to have old-fashioned uh, hay rides with sleighs horse-drawn sleighs, and uh, they ended up having to cancel it because mine is 40. So it was just way too cold. So we ended up staying inside and building gingerbread-style houses with um, graham crackers because <laughs> they're pre-made, right? You don't have to, uh, you don't have to bake the pieces, so. Yeah, minus 40 in uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit is the same. It just happens to line up there. I remember one year, my husband, my husband, my son was just a toddler. I think he was two or maybe three and he wanted to play outside and it was minus 40. And I said, it's too cold. And he just, he wanted to go outside so bad. I said, okay, fine, but just five minutes, you know. And uh, so get them all bundled up and uh, open the door. He steps outside, he feels how cold it is. And then he turns around and says, come in. <laughs> I said, yeah, I tried to tell you it was too cold. <sighs> but he had to feel it for himself, so. You know, I said it was kind of like when um, we had to take our guinea pig to the vet. Um, and it was still winter, not terribly cold. It's like minus 20 instead of minus 40 Celsius. But, um, you know, cold enough. So I got her carrier and I put a big fuzzy blanket in it got a couple others to put on top of her to keep her warm and she kept on trying to poke her face out until I opened the door and we went outside and then as soon as she felt how cold it was just yeah she pulled her face back in and then she didn't move anymore it's like yeah I know you don't like your face covered but I was trying to cover you up because it is cold and they come from warmer climates like I think Peru or something so yeah you have to be very careful it is very easy for them to catch a chill. Although it's getting warm enough soon, I may be able to give her some time on the lawn. She likes to be out in the sun. And we got a fair amount of clover in our yard, which she loves to eat, and some dandelions. She doesn't eat the flowers, just the uh, the leaves and the stems. It's kind of funny. If you give her a stack, she'll eat them and the, the heads of the dandelions will pop off if she gets to the end of the stalk and she just leaves it there. So at the end, she just ends up with this little pile of the yellow flowers. <laughs> yeah, she likes the green parts. Same with the clover. She doesn't eat the flowers. She just likes the uh, the leaves. Yeah, she's still hanging in there. Okay. Yeah, this area is a little less confetti than the flowers were. Those, uh, these purpley, pinky flowers were a lot more colors than they look like. So that bit went fairly slow, but now we're getting into the um, the stonework and the fountain. There's quite a lot of larger blocks of colors, so it goes a little bit quicker. Although I say, as I have like five parked threads in the row below this one I'm doing, so. <laughs> yeah, no more zeros yet. My colors, some of them are getting close. They're 
a hundred or less, you know, down from like 3,000 stitches, but yeah, it's a ways. I guess that's one thing with the um, extreme cross-country stitchers. A lot of them will pick the ones with the uh, least amount of, of uh, stitches first, so then they can get the zeros. And then some people prefer to start with the um, the most to sort of give them an outline and more landmarks, and then go to the uh, the uh, colors that have fewer stitches. Yeah, not my way to stitch, but it's interesting to watch. Oh, wait a minute. I parked that wrong, didn't I? Oh, no, I know what I did. Uh -huh. I colored in. Yeah, I did not park that wrong. What happened is I colored in these two stitches above it and forgot to do them. Yeah, uh, goldfish brain. <laughs> but then again, a nice thing about stitching this way with uh, not closing anything in, I very quickly saw something wasn't right here because to do the stitches that are highlighted right now would have closed in ones above them and the pattern keeper was showing them as being done. So then I knew something didn't add up wasn't matching because I made a mistake. Oh my gosh, he says, and then parks it in the wrong place. Aye, I tell ya. Oh, come on. Oh, you are just going to be a pain, aren't you? There we go. There, that was supposed to be parked right here. The other thread that was hanging at the back, I just held it sort of up and out of my way so I wouldn't catch it with that one as I was reparking it. <clears throat> so yeah, if my work and the pattern don't match, that usually means I've made a mistake on the stitching. Now we are fixed. Oh my. Goodness, water coolers being especially loud today. Have to check that later. Yeah, we did not have luck with that for quite a while. We kept getting the um, the top loading style ones where you put the uh, you know the water jug on top, and then we had three in a row that were faulty. It was ridiculous. My husband had to take them back to the store. As I had it one time, I was sitting quietly and hear this splash come out of nowhere. I'm like, what the heck? So I go and I check the water <coughs> cooler and there's, you know, about a cup of water on the floor around it. Thought, well, that was strange. So I mop it up and it goes sit back down again. And about 15 minutes later, I hear splash again. I'm going, what the heck? You know, nobody has touched that water cooler. What is it doing this for? So I mop it up again and, you know, sort of wiggle things around and look and it seems okay and I sit down and then same thing and I realized what was happening was the valve or whatever that holds it was faulty and so it would fill up with water slowly and then when it got to be too much it would release and psh, water goes everywhere and then it would stop and then it would fill up again so I had to drain the rest of the water out of it because you can't just you know lift the bottle out of it once it's open it's gonna get everywhere so did that and uh husband went and bought a new one had the same issue you know, I didn't hear it splash that time, but then I came over and there's water on the floor. It's like, oh, come on. So twice he did that. Finally, after that, he said, forget it. And he spent more money and we have one that now, um, instead of sitting on the top and gravity pulling it down, it actually sits on the bottom and it has like this big straw thing that goes in it and it sucks it, pumps it out when you push the button to, um, to get water out of it. It pumps it up. So yeah, 
less likely to leak that way. And so far, cross fingers, it's been good. And it's fairly quiet usually. And the motor pump is not very loud either, so. Yeah, plus easier on the back than lifting those ginormous jugs. In fact, I uh, got to the point where I couldn't buy the big 18 liter ones anymore. They're like 18.9 liters, so almost 19 liters, which is like, you know, over four gallons. And uh, for those of you who don't use um, liters. And uh, yeah, it's so heavy that uh, it hurt my back to uh, get them from the store and put them in my car and then, you know, bring them in the house and put them on the machine. So I started getting the little ones. They're like 11 liters that I could handle without hurting myself. So that's kind of nice, but now I don't have to lift it at all, which is really nice. Just pull the old one out, slide the new one in across the floor, pop the top off, stick the straw in and you're good to go. Yeah, I mean, technically our tap water is drinkable, but it's got a lot of minerals in it. It doesn't taste great. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, um, when I wash my stitching, when I'm done a project, I do a final rinse with distilled water so you don't get hard water stains on your fabric. Yeah, hard water stains are awful. They build up on your bathtub and there's only so much you can do to scrub them off and on your water glasses and stuff. I mean, I do use the uh, rinse aid, but even so, there's still only so much you can do. Tougher on your skin and hair, too. I actually had a filter uh, for my shower head. Ooh. My gosh, pardon me. Okay, I can see I'm going to have probably several threads going here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is the edge of the wall, so it's, uh, again, going in a vertical sort of direction. Kind of like the pillars earlier. accidentally said in one of my updates that I was two-thirds done, but I was mistaken. I was 60% done. 66 is two-thirds, so maybe by the next update I will be at two-thirds. You yeah, had someone who thought I was at three-quarters. Well, not quite. I got more passes on the bottom than you might think, but we will get there. Yeah, I'm a process crafty person, not just about the product. The journey is what I like the most yeah it was funny because somebody said they started a supersize max color um having an earth design pattern one of the amy stewart ones which is like over seven hundred thousand stitches i don't think anyone's actually finished it yet because yeah, that is a lot <laughs> and it's also her patterns are very very detailed so there is a lot of confetti so that slows things down a bit. Like I have the Firefly one I'm working on, which is, uh, you know, 550,000, but there is quite a lot of background that is black or just, you know, three or four colors. So that part does go faster. Yeah, it was suggested that maybe I could um, work on black fabric and avoid that background, but yeah. I've tried darker fabric before and my eyes do not like it. So I would rather stitch all that black than strain my eyes. Yeah, I know um, in the last while, uh, Needlebug, she had to give up working on the higher counts, which I felt so bad for her. Because, yeah, it was giving her eye strain. So fortunately, she can still stitch. She just has to stitch on bigger, lower counts. And um, I tell you, the crafty, <clears throat> the 
The people of the crafty world are just so lovely. There were so many people offering to finish the project and, and ship it back to her because she was looking to rehome the stuff that she couldn't work on anymore. And this was such a lovely outpouring of support. It was really heartwarming. Yeah, so she's one of the channels I follow. She's the one who got me uh, started with uh, parking. I tried before and it just wouldn't click. And her videos were really helpful. And then I, over time, sort of tweaked it until I do it the way I do it now. Okay, and 3-2. Yeah, she didn't let it keep her down for long either. She made a new start very quickly, so I was really happy to see that. Yeah, like I said, YouTube, some parts of YouTube are, oh boy, people can be really mean, but the crafty corner of YouTube is quite lovely. Yeah, people are mostly very kind and positive. Yeah, I would say crafty people are some of the best people. I truly believe humans were made to create things. I think that's when we're the happiest. To learn things or build things, fix things, create things. Yeah. That makes us happy. At least in my experience. Okay, let's see. How long is this bit? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I go down and come back up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably add another thread for the lower stuff that's not right along the edge here. In fact, I'll even do this one too, I think. Yeah, I was looking at other patterns on Etsy, like as if I need any more, but uh, I was browsing Star Trek patterns and saw a Deep Space Nine one, but yeah, if you think there's a lot of black on my Firefly project, yeah, there's way more there. So the Deep Space Nine space station. And I was thinking, you know, I might get bored stitching that too because it's uh, almost like a geometric shape, right? So I've seen some people's uh, fractal patterns, which are just gorgeous, but I don't think they'd be for me. I think I would get bored sort of stitching the same pattern over and over. So, but I love to watch other people's. There are some absolutely stunning ones that I have seen. I've always thought it's kind of interesting how math, which, you know, has rules and stuff, can also be such an expression of beauty, like with fractal patterns or with music. You know, there's math rules to music, and it's always been fascinating to me that something as expressive as music can be, you know, um, also expressed mathematically. It's uh, kind of fascinating, actually, to me. I took um, music theory for a while too because uh, it was required in the higher grades of piano and sort of how people can add to arrangements and such um, with arpeggios and things because of, you know, the key signature and there's certain rules of how the song goes. And yeah, I just always thought that's just really neat. Okay, so time for another thread in this part. Because, yeah, I was saying, like, you think of math as being this this rigid, you know, thing with these these strict rules, and yet it can be used to display beauty, too. It's, I don't know, I just thought that was really kind of neat. 
It's funny because I said I'm not a math person, but then at the same time, I've played music. I knit, which has a lot of math, especially if you want your uh, sweaters and things to fit, right? Because you can't just grab a certain needles and yarn and expect it to always make the same because everybody's tension is different. And you have to get a similar tension, so... Yeah, otherwise you're, uh, you know, one extra stitch per inch or even extra stitch per every two or three inches and your, your garment is going to be much too big or too small if you go the other way. So, yeah. And I did a lot of uh, customizing stuff for myself since my shape is not the same as uh, the patterns. As much as it, I didn't like doing the math, it was worth it to have a uh, perfectly tailored garment at the end. And another one, yeah. I knew I was going to end up with multiples here. That is okay. As usual, there's a lot of this color, so I would have ended up with multiple threads anyway. Even if I wasn't attaching multiple threads to uh, avoid closing stuff in. Oh my gosh. Man, I have a lot of needles on the threads. We'll see whether I need to reset soon or not. Yeah, I've been doing better with more of them, but there is still a limit. Okay. Just color in what I'm doing so it's more clear to you. I know what it is, but if you're following along. We're going to hit the edge of the diagonal soon, so I will probably get some needles back then at that point. Okay. And another shade of blue. I think there's probably like 30 shades of blue on this pattern out of like, you know, 90. Probably what drew me to it. I love blue. When I was a kid, my favorite was pink, but it became blue when I got older. And my sister-in-law's was yellow, so her uh, email address was Think Yellow. Throwback to the uh, the yellow pages when we still used phone books. Yeah, so I'm guessing uh, kids these days would not understand the uh, cleverness behind that. Because <laughs> yeah, I remember those ads. Next time, Think Yellow. I'm surprised they still print phone books. I mean, we still get them. I can't remember the last time I actually used one for anything besides, like, as a booster <laughs> to put something sitting on it or, you know, as a weight to flatten out paper or something with a crease in it. <laughs> or someone was saying it was pretty funny because, um, yeah, they often used a phone book as a booster seat for their their little one and they went to visit some family and uh, they lived in a small town and so she's asking can I have a phone book they said well of course as well to put it under the baby they're like looking at her like but why they finally handed it to her and it's six pages long 
It's like, oh, no wonder they thought she was being weird, you know? What do you want your kid to sit on six pieces of paper for? That's especially phone book paper, right? Which is super thin. Like, that's not going to do anything. <sighs> yeah, it wasn't like, say, Vancouver when I remember they had multiple phone books. So, like, you know, A to M was one book and, you know, N to Z was another book. And uh, then yellow pages were separate books. And, of course, there were, like, four of those because there were so many businesses and... Yeah. I remember we like to look up our own number in the phone book. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. Yeah, sounding like, you know, these, in my day we had a hoop and a stick. Or, oh, it was funny. The other day I was watching a movie. Somebody made a call and they got the doo-doo-doo sound. And they said, oh, it's going to voicemail. I'm going, that's not the going to voicemail sound. That's the, this call, this number has been disconnected sound. I guess whoever um, was doing the sound effects didn't know that. So they just picked a phone sound without realizing that it actually means something different. Or, yeah, they used to, you know, the number you have dialed cannot be connected. Please check the number and dial again. I remember it was really weird one time. My phone rang, and I answered it, and then that's what it said. The number you have dialed cannot be connected. I'm like, I didn't dial a number. <laughs> I'm guessing maybe somebody tried to call me, and then it sent me the disconnected sound or something. I don't know. It was some very weird glitch. It's like, okay, so is there, like, a ghost making uh, calls on my phone? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, let's see, I think we will be ending off some threads and getting some threads, some needles back, I should say. Yeah, remembering the days when we had to call information to find somebody's number if, you, you know, they were out of um, area for your phone book. It's like, I wonder if there are still people you can call for that now or if it's all just online. Do they still have operators? I mean, they obviously don't have as much as they used to. Things have changed, but... Uh, Yeah. Okay, that is out of the diagonal, so arc and unthread. Yeah, I think we're actually so close to the edge here and the way the colors are going. I am just going to tuck all these away and I will work on them when I do the next diagonal. So as you can see, it's a, not always a straight diagonal line. It's just a rough guide. And how the colors line up against it sort of changes what I do. But I also think that'll help to, to avoid lines. I've never really had a problem with lines, but if you do, this could help. Sort of a natural feathering of that edge there so that you don't have sharp straight lines. Yeah, there was somebody who was saying that they found a way to, when they ended up with column lines, you go to the back and sort of sew back and forth over it. Yeah, I've never had to do that, but I mean, it was nice to hear that there was there is a way you could potentially fix it. Of course, better to avoid it in the first place, but, you know, also a way that you won't have to throw away a ton of work if you've already done a bunch. Okay, another one here. Ah, I, in fact, I unthreaded that one anyway because I knew that's what I planned to do. Ah, and another one we can end here. Oh, grabbed two needles. 
There we are. Okay, good. I was thinking that might have been a shorter piece. But no, it'll be long enough to do all these stitches in this area. So that is good. Gotcha. Nice. Older tablet taking a little longer to load there. Okay, so if you've seen me work, you usually know I kind of start from the outside in and then back out, but because this is part sort of on the inside edge, I'm going to probably work more from the inside out. So that's just, again, what makes sense to me. Instead of doing this one stitch and having a longer carry to get it out to that right edge, so I can be adaptable. There. Yeah, that one's not very long, so that works out well, actually. Just 
do the stitch it's parked in and end it off. If I can find the correct spot to go down, that is. This one, we may have to reset. We shall see. Oh, here I am trying to pull the wrong one out. There it is. We got it. wondering if that was the company car. It's quite loud. Um, my husband works for radio station, I probably mentioned before, and they have a uh, GTO as what, like, basically their mascot car. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I posted some pictures of it, and I said, you know, your work may be cool, but is it, I get to drive a GTO cool, so. Yeah, because they had a problem once. They had it parked, um, in the work parking lot and there weren't enough people around. So somebody tried to steal it, broke in and uh, they couldn't figure out how to uh, to actually steal it. Cause it's a, uh, for one thing it's a manual and also it has um steering wheel lock, I guess. And uh, they broke off the steering wheel with a crowbar. I said like, what were they trying to do at that point? I, my husband said, probably just uh, to damage it because they were mad they couldn't steal it. Because yeah, so if you break the steering wheel off, how the heck are you gonna steal it, right? But anyway, so that happened. And because it was a commercial area and it happened like on a Sunday, nobody was around to hear the alarm. And uh, yeah, it did a lot of damage. So now they actually have us park it in our driveway when it's not in winter storage. Cause it's a it's a summer car, you know, it's, it's an old racing muscle car. You're not gonna be driving that on ice. So, uh, Yeah, we get it parked in our driveway, and then, of course, my car's boxing it in, so there's, you know, no way anybody could easily steal that. And, you know, it's a residential area. If the alarm goes off, you're going to hear it, so. <laughs> yeah. My husband and only one other guy can drive it because um, they said you have to double clutch, and it's pretty difficult to do. Plus, it's such an, it's a, you know, overpowered car because it is a racing car, right? It's a muscle car, so... Even if you can drive stick, you got to be careful because it could uh, get away from you quite easily. It's, like I said, so overpowered. But, yeah. Yeah, my husband's uh, 45. He learned how to drive on a manual. He and his dad work with cars a lot, so he has a lot of experience. And same, the other guy who can drive it is his age, so... Yeah. Yeah, a couple times he actually was... After a work event, he got to pick our son up from school, and it's almost like, hey, they had the coolest car in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, and he gets to do the maintenance on it, too, as part of his job. So he loves that. Yeah, my uncle said, well, I don't get to drive a GTO, but I get to drive a food truck. I said, okay, yeah, that, that's pretty, that's a good second, you know. I love food. So, yeah, they have a, um... Fish and chips uh, truck for the summer. So yeah, pretty yummy. It's definitely the traditional style fish and chips. And, uh, yeah, it was delicious. Yeah, as I mentioned before, I grew up on Vancouver Island, so we ate a lot of seafood and not so much here because of course their seafood was cheaper since you're, you know, right by the ocean and so fresh. You know, you could get stuff that had been caught that morning. So.
So I remember shelling shrimp with my grandma to make lunch, go to the dock and buy it straight from the, from there, yeah. Yeah, my husband's not a big seafood fan, but I am. But unfortunately, yeah, because uh, we're inland now, it's a lot more expensive. Here, beef is cheap and seafood is expensive. Whereas when I lived on the island, seafood was expensive or was cheap and beef was expensive. So okay, I remember after we moved out here and we visited my parents and we're having dinner and like, and we have black Angus beef. And we're like, oh, OK, because to us at that point. It wasn't anything special. Almost all the beef at the supermarket is Black Angus. So. Yeah, my husband got sent to Atlantic Canada one year for a conference. And he doesn't like seafood. Poor guy. That's like all there is, you know. And, uh. He said, yeah, he said one night, he said, I ordered a chicken burger. It must have been sitting in the freezer for like two years. So it was disgusting. It was just freezer burned and rubbery. And yeah, he said it was horrible. So He said it was so jealous because like the company bought him lobster to eat and he doesn't even like it. I'm like, oh, I would have loved going there. Love seafood. Then he brought home our son a little stuffy lobster, which he named Pinchy. <laughs> and he used to think it was so funny. He would have us uh, chase him with the with the lobster and, and then just lightly pinch his arm and say, Pinch! <laughs> oh, but it, oh man, it sucked. It was a conference and they scheduled it for some reason in like the middle of February. And it's, you know, it was nothing to do with winter. This was in communications. He was working for a different radio station then. And, um... So, you know, Canada in February is not the time to be traveling if you can help it because snow, right? And so I think our son was about four or five at the time. And um, he wasn't used to, you know, dad being gone for so long. Dad was going to be gone for a week. So we got him a calendar and we wrote, you know, on it that when daddy comes home and then he was able to cross off a, a day um, at bedtime so he could see that okay daddy will be home you know in this many more days and then there was a ginormous blizzard and he got uh, he got stuck everything was grounded for you know three or four days he just he couldn't get out of there and our son was all upset he didn't want to talk to him on a zoom because he thought dad didn't want to come home you know he didn't understand that no it's uh it's not up to him nothing is flying and uh you know, to rent a car and drive across the country would be too expensive and even more time consuming. And yeah, the company didn't want to do it because then, you know, there's the liability issue. So yeah, they just had to wait for the storm to clear up till he could get home. And I said, you know, it wasn't like it was a conference on ice fishing. You didn't need it to be winter. Who the heck decided that to have a Canada-wide conference where people have to come to you to hold it in the middle of February, you know, where the chances of a blizzard grounding everything are high. Yeah, and oh, he said on the way to the airport, he got locked out of his truck when he was uh, stopping at a gas station. And uh, he had to break off the antenna because a coat hanger wasn't strong enough to sort of get between the seal of the door and the frame. And he had to use that as a hook to try and, you know, get his keys out and he was almost late for his flight out. And he said, you know, I should have known that was an omen and just turned back then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he got to stay in Halifax for like three, four extra days. He said, yeah, we watched a lot of movies because there was nothing else to do. But there was a movie theater sort of within walking distance of the, uh, of the hotel that was still running. So he and like two other guys, that's all they did was went to the movies. Saw the first um, Sherlock Holmes movie with um, starring uh, Robert Downey Jr. And uh, what's his name? Oh my gosh, I just drew a blank. I'm sure some of you are yelling at me, knowing who it is. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. So yeah, he got to see that way before I did <laughs> on the company dime. So, you know, that wasn't too bad. Jude Law, that's it. Ah, I knew it would come to me. I was thinking Judd, no, Judd's not right. But I knew it was something similar to that, so. Yeah, apparently those two became uh, quite good friends from working on that set. I said, you can tell, you know, their, their chemistry is great. Yes, I heard there's a third movie that they made or they're gonna make. We saw the first two, we own them. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I also watched the uh, BBC Sherlock with um, Benedict Cumberbatch. And um, the first two seasons I quite enjoyed, but then the, the last two, because there were four seasons, the last two got very weird weird and very like artsy almost gothic I don't know it was yeah but basically they took you know an hour and a half to tell a story that really only needed 45 minutes and then it was just padded with a lot of weird imagery so I ended up I did finish it but yeah I was kind of disappointed it was on uh, Prime I don't know if it still is but it was so Okay, another one we can end. Oh, look at that. Yeah. I had a feeling that wasn't securely through the eye of the needle. Oh. Just, okay. Had to feel, whoops, bonk. That there wasn't a knot on the back. There. That is secure. Since that is still threaded, I will just take care of it. If it wasn't, I probably would have just tucked it away for the next section. There, so we have the corner of the uh, fountain wall, I think, here. All right. And let's see, where am I going to put this? Okay, I'm going to park this in the next square thing. Yeah. There. Okay.
Yeah, these tiny little pieces get very fiddly, but they're good for the one stitch by itself, so. I'll deal with the fiddliness. Drop my needle. Good. So I didn't have to reset. I managed to finish off enough threads that I got enough unthreaded that it wasn't a tangle anymore. fewer colors in this area, so, yeah. But then we're gonna get the edge of the flowers there. So that'll be a, a bit more detail work. thread is very staticky. It doesn't want to let go. Actually working from that sort of left out will work well because of these ones here. 
and I don't want to close stuff in so I'll be switching back and forth and yeah just works out better actually that way oh I thought that wasn't threaded oh well, it's unthreaded now oh well no problem Sometimes when I'm working in areas where there's only a couple of colors and I'm having to switch back and forth uh, between them, sometimes I will take the search feature off and just stay to the highlight version. Just do it that way. I'll show you what I mean. So. so this way, you know, you can manually highlight anything. So you have to be a little more careful. And of course, because it's not searched for you make sure you don't miss any but yeah if I'm doing a lot of switching back and forth between colors I will sometimes do that I find that a little easier than to continue searching through the colors back and forth so like I'll do these two number three symbol Double taps, if you have them set up, will still work for making parking marks. So yeah, and you're working in an area that's kind of like almost a checkerboard, back and forth between two colors, I find this a little easier. Switch to search mode, search for it, highlight it, park it, switch to search mode, search a new symbol, highlight park, and it kind of cuts out a step. So. There. So, that's what I mean. So, anyway, I think I'll be calling it a break here. Wow, we had a pretty productive session today. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And I hope I will see you here again another time. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye.